Thank you all for coming. Right. So uh, my name's Ed. I've run these uh, lead creative talks and I'll be doing these every month, starting next month, once a month. And yeah, uh, it's all to help creativity. And if you're ever looking to go into a creative field or want some refreshing, these are perfect talks for you to just pop in, listen and take something with you. Uh, so today we're going to talk about storytelling in design and how it can help you creatively and how it can help you think of more ideas and do better visual designs. Okay. Yeah. So who am I? Lead is a community and interest company to help uh, Led is a community interest company to build a creative community in Ipswich. What I try to do is I try to network, uh, bring all the different uh, artists, writers, filmmakers, musicians together in, and make a creative hub for everyone to just turn up and uh, yeah, network, collaborate and do, do some do something that can get everyone at Ipswich to shout about. I also help promote people who needs promoting. If you're uh, a musician or an artist, I try to make sure that I connect you to the right people to uh, let people know that you exist and your work exists and people can, do, uh, can shout about that. I also advocate, I try, I'm trying to uh, I do workshops to help p people uh, think more creatively and think more professionally and how to uh, get people to enter the, these creative fields that Ipswich really needs. And joining me is Mark Aaron. Uh, he's a graphic designer who, do you want to tell people what kind of things you do? I mainly work in television and games. Um, what kind of games? All, so, all sorts of things, a lot of uh, kind of app based stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, so I work on a lot of light entertainment stuff for ITV. Yeah. Uh, I develop the uh, world branding guidelines and those sorts of things for things like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, developed all the logos and motion graphics and those sorts of things. Um, lots and lots of game shows, probably every game show you've ever heard of. Um, that sort of pays the mortgage. Yeah. That's good yeah. fun. Who wants to be a millionaire? Uh, yeah. Crystal Maze. Mm -hmm. I've just been working on Crystal Maze. The two new yeah. series of the Crystal Maze, yeah. Which is good fun. Yeah. You um, helped do the, uh, the new zone. The, the new zone is what I was working on, yeah. yeah. Uh, which was, I think it's just come out. I don't, I, I don't know, because I'm working on stuff that's yeah. not coming out until January. Oh, wow. Which is now finished. We've finished our yeah. bit. And so you is forget it, what's, what so you've done. So is it what, when you're done, you don't remember it anymore? You just no, no, you're immediately moving, yeah. on to the, moving on to the next project or, or whatever that may be. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's the, that's the core of my sort of like professional yeah. practice, as it were, is to, is, is to develop yeah. branding and identity for projects in television. Yeah. But that's also gone on to things like I worked on The Apprentice. Um, and they actually, the producers approached me and asked me to actually write an episode and prepare the brief um, for the candidates. And as if that wasn't punishment enough, they then asked me to actually be on the show as the design guru and actually guide the candidates through the process of how to think about product, think about color, think about shape, think about if, whether things are tactile, uh, practical, cost effective, green, all those kind of lenses when you're creating a create, creating a, yeah. a product or a brand or whatever it may be, you're also a composer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So more punishment. Yeah. What kind it's, of well, it's I, I mainly I I write classical music really, um, and I've just done a feature film, local feature film, and we're now starting on our second yeah. local feature the film, Haunted Hotel. Haunted Hotel, yeah. which was done by Film Suffolk, yeah. which was a follow up to. We'd love from Suffolk. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, but so um, so I've just finished scoring the. Second Do you know film. when that's out? December. December. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
also, what are you working on at the moment? A... Oh, right. Um, well, I'm scripting my own film. Yeah. Which is. So a you're challenge. adding scriptwriter to that list. Well, I don't know because I, I actually this this comes on to a kind of wider subject that I kind of wanted to dip into with everybody here, and that is, is that when, if you're in a, um, a the creative industries in any way, and whether that's just you know, flower arranging at home or directing a film or whatever it may be, don't restrict yourself uh, to what labels other people might put on you. Because I think actually it all comes from the same place. Whether you're writing music or whether you're writing a script or whether you're painting or sculpting or an architect or whatever it is, you're all, we're all engaged in that practice of imagining. Yeah. And then yeah. the, 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 the skills and the tools yeah are one thing, but where you want to go is, is, is another. So I think I, I anybody that's in the I creative I remember the field first time I met you, you told me that uh, there's a lot of people who mistake you for being one p set of person and... Oh, that's, that's yeah. commercially. Yeah. Commercially, what tends to happen is that I'll be working with one TV company and they'll think, oh, yeah, Mark is the guy that does X, Y, and Z's one aspect of, of TV or film graphic production. And then literally the company next door knows me for the other side of it but neither would consider me for the opposite role because they it's easy to sort of tick boxes and put labels on people and just kind of forge ahead yeah. whereas i tend to go oh I've, i'm just naturally curious i think i think all creative people are naturally curious so yeah. you just go oh how does that work yeah. how does animating work how does script writing work yeah. how does you know what what yeah. what what are you going to discover and then whatever you discover how are you then going to apply that to what you're already doing yeah. so you're constantly turning everything over and yeah. moving forward and anything else you're working on um just launch well i'm just about to launch a company um, um to produce um a range of toys uh which are completely ethically produced but also designed in such a way uh, that um, they hopefully engage uh, children and parents and whoever into a space which is non-screen time. Yeah. Uh, so and away from video <coughs> games. And <coughs> well, yeah, and that's not being anti-video no. games or anything like that. I think what it is is that we've been having conversations for three, four, five years about the environment. But there's also the kind of psychological environment that we live in, our cultural, social environment. Not only the pollution yeah. and you know, poor air quality or whatever it may be, um, there's also a kind of social pollution and a kind of a disconnect somewhere. So it was a way of thinking about that whole conversation in its broadest context and saying, can we actually subvert the industry in some way and produce something which is going to do that? So. Um, um, I've, I'm, on the, I'm a director of the company. Uh, the other director of the company is, um, well, one of the other directors uh, is a guy called Stephen Mulhern, who's a television magician, and he presents um, Saturday Night Takeaway with Ant and Deck and uh, that uh, sort of stuff. So we've got... He's yeah. ITV. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. ITV's darling at the yeah. moment, so I'm very lucky to have yeah. him on board as a director. Yeah. And obviously the key to get having him on board is that it's a fantastic open channel for us to publicise what we're doing and have those kind of conversations about ethical consumerism with Lorraine and all those kind of TV shows, you know, to yeah. try and get it out there. So that, that so, was yeah. the, that's the core of that. No. So anyway, we're, no, no. Yeah, we're not yeah. teaching anybody anything now. No. I'm just the so <coughs> what does storytelling mean for you? That's a tough one. I, I knew you were going to chuck me that question. It's, um, I, th I think when we think about storytelling what we're doing actually is we're creating a lens through which we l view our own work so it's just a a way of thinking about whatever you're doing whether it's something static or whether it is something you know like a full feature film the same thinking when you when you frame it or use that lens of storytelling will apply even, even if you're just painting, a static painting, because the way people read information, even take a static painting, for example, you can read 
a brush stroke. A brush stroke can be boop, it can be slow, and the physics of it, the, the application of it, can be read 200 years later. Mm. That, that mark, that moment. And, th and there is storytelling in that. Yeah. You know, so. And storytelling for me is more about uh, feelings and emotions and like, it can be other things, but for me personally, it's all about expressing yourself to <coughs> others in a way that people can relate to. Okay. Well, let me, I'll, I'll think about it a little bit. If you, the moment you say a story, you're automatically talking about an A and a B, a yeah. start place. And so you're yeah. talking about a journey of some yes. kind. Um, and even in, you know, as I say, if yeah. you had a static designed poster, there is a narrative to be read in yeah. that. The way you would approach the work, the way you would think about it, think about the story you're actually trying to tell. And even a joke or a piece of music or whatever it is, you know, sets out its case, yeah. creates some trepidation, yeah. and then resolves with surprise or with yeah. humour or, or whatever it may be. So that's yeah. narrative structure. I Nar guess. Yeah, we'll get to that. Sorry, <laughs> jumping ahead. Yeah. So, a story has its purpose and its path. It must be told correctly for it to be understood. Well, yes and no. I mean, I've, have, ever, have you seen, has anybody seen the film Memento? Which can be it's read a, forward and backwards. Yeah. It's a film that goes backwards. So you see the end at the start and then it keeps on laying, layering, uh, yeah, going backwards slowly towards the start and it tells a story in a very unconventional way. It's Christopher Nolan's first film, yeah. I think. I yeah. don't think it's his first, but well, okay. it's one yeah, of it was the, the one that broke, one that, that broke yeah. him, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah just... Uh, no, but yes. it's very... But even, even that, if you unpack that film and you watch it, it still uh, has the beginning and the middle and the end. Yes. You know, it's still... It's still and you can't escape that. Uh, but what makes this quote true for that is that it must be told correctly. If you told that backward story in a normal way, it's not, a, in, not as a interesting story as it could be. No, 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 because it's what you don't know. Yes, and that's, exactly. a, that's a key to storytelling, yeah. is, is allowing people, to, find people to unpack it and, un and find out for themselves, yeah. So, map and territory. <laughs> Is anybody familiar with the concept of map and territory? Do, I know, do you know what I mean by that? It's kind of yeah. so. If we say the territory of the world, our world, it's this chair. If I describe it to you, language is a map of that. Um, all storytelling is the map. It is not the territory. Yeah. I think that's the. So, but it can be subverted. Yeah. I'm sure. Like, if you say map. Does it mean like uh, I'm in Ipswich and that gives, gives you an idea of what it is? I think that there, there's something, uh, we all have an internal map of the, of the universe, yes. of the world, of which we are at the centre. Yeah. We have things that we do that we unconsciously do. They're so familiar, you know, driving to the shops, uh, logging onto your online bank account, you know, you, yeah. these passwords, they just pop out of nowhere. Yeah. They're all part of the map. And They're not actually yeah. real, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that's kind of uh, giving your story a base. Yeah. And uh, you know how to get from A to B. It's just finding That's right, and yeah. And territory comes when uh, you've got the stuff in between the A to Bs. Well, or the, or the, it's, the, it's the feeling. It's the, yes. it's, it's, it's the, the, the thing that you, you experience without expelling it or, yeah. or, or describing it in some way. Yeah. Unfortunately, our brains tend to describe things as we learn them and we learn through language. Yeah. So even our experience of the world, our tactile experience yeah. of the world, is, um, is uh, subverted by the way we remember things yeah. and recall them. And the witness... Uh, yeah, um, there was a couple of little anecdotes we talked about yeah, yeah. before you know, we, we sort of arrived here today. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about memory <coughs> and what role memory plays in storytelling. And that's a whole yeah. l very, very long subject. But essentially, the way, if you're not familiar with it, the way we remember 
is that when we recall something we, and we put it back and forget it again, what we've done is that we've rewritten the memory and we put it back. So here's a classic example of it. Um, awful, you've, you've been witness to a, a, a minor prying in a car and you've been witness to it and you're being interviewed by the police afterwards and the police would turn around to you and say something like, so in your witness statement you didn't say whether the act the prang happened before the tree or after the tree. And you think about it, you're not quite sure, but your brain will lead you into a saying, oh maybe it was after the tree or maybe it was before the tree, it will take you down one of those routes. And it will pop the memory back and when somebody asks you again you'll say, oh that prang, yeah, it was just after the tree, after the junction, there's a tree there, blah, 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 blah. There was no tree. Yeah. There was never, never a tree. tree. That's how your brains work. Yeah. They rewrite what you remember yeah. when you put it back. So memories are never <coughs> accurate when you... The interesting part of that is that we are, from a design point of view, we're all living in a kind of shifting, cultural, interesting landscape um, of different ideas and feelings and tropes and those sorts of things. Classic, you know, take me too. Me Too as a movement, or uh, Greta Thunberg's, you know, uh, climate, uh, climate strikes on Fridays and stuff. Uh, they have changed the national conversation. They have changed the global conversation. They've changed the conversations that we have on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And you can't go back. These things have happened. Yeah. And now everything that you do is now framed with those ideas. So I was thinking of what, what would be inappropriate. And I was thinking of an advert I remember seeing in Creative Review in the 80s. And, it, and you know, the industry, create advertising industry, going, oh, yeah, it's the greatest advert ever or whatever, you know. And I can't remember the model, but it was an advert for a bra. And the woman was just wearing this push-up bra. And it just said, hello, boys, over the top. And now that would be so inappropriate. It would be so inappropriate. And, but we don't realise how far culture has yeah. changed and shifted. Um, and as a designer or artist or maker of any kind, you're constantly presented with, you know, the world as you feel it is now has always been this way, but it has not. It is constantly evolving and constantly shifting, constantly changing. And it all, and all these changes feed your imagination. It's one story leads to another and then, you tell another story. It's kind of like Chinese whispers. It goes from one person to another, and then another person, you go to another person. And by the time the first story was told to the last story, it's completely different. It is completely different, but there is a, there's a kind of universal truth of storytelling. Oh, yes. And uh, I was reading, I've been reading a book, believe it or not, about script writing, because I'm writing a script. And I, I picked up a quote from there the other day, and I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. And the, the guy who was writing the book described the story where he was saying, um, I asked this nine-year-old son of a friend to write a story. Because I'm a script writer, yeah. you know, he, this guy writes spooks and, and yeah. all these kind of things, <coughs> thrillers and stuff. And the child wrote this story uh, and, and it was, uh, mum wanted to take us on holiday, but she couldn't take us on holiday because she had to pay the rent. We found a treasure map in the garden we went hunting for treasure, we got chased, we got in trouble, we escaped, we found the treasure, we all went on a better holiday. And that was a nine-year-old story. Without any um, education about storytelling or anything, it's kind of this universal three-act play, or, or mm. you know, that, yeah. that is within all of us, you know, yeah. the, the hero's journey or whatever it yes. may be. You know. And it sounds like, just like the Goonies. <laughs> It does it. It sounds <laughs> yes. like maybe the kid had seen the yeah, Goonies. I don't know, but it was you know yeah. it was recent. So, yeah. um. <coughs> narrative and time. How does narrative affect time? So I, I hadn't thought about this, but I think we all think about it. But when you asked me that question, and I started sort of unpacking it and thinking about that, it took me down this road of reading about memory and reading about how we how we divide time. If I were to say now, that's now in everyone's past. It's gone, you can't grab it, it's like smoke. Yeah. But our brains don't work like that. Our language tells us it should when we say now, 
but actually our brains don't. What I've been reading about and what I've discovered is that we tend to think of individual moments as probably about the length of a sentence or between flickers of an eye, you know, it's uh, uh, you know, between blinks. Yeah. We, we tend to think of kind of fuzzy cloud-like moments of now yeah. as opposed to indivisible slices of now, if that makes sense. So that was so. When it comes to time, that's where that was my starting point yeah. to think. Yeah, and how do we think about it? And memory is a very uh, tricky thing because what you remember of like ten years ago isn't actually you recalling what you thought about ten years ago. It's uh, it's what you remember the last time you thought about ten years ago. So if I said I spoke to you three months ago mm -hmm. uh, what I'm actually remembering is uh, the last time I thought about me talking to you three months ago so exactly it might right. be like me recalling last week that I spoke to you three months ago and those details can shift again it's kind of like Chinese whispers it goes from one thing to another and then by the time the longer it gets since you last thought about it the more it distorts and memory is such a very uh, strange thing to... Yeah, well... The, it's the, easily the, manipulated. Yeah, so when I think about that uh, Hello Boys um, advert, yeah. it wasn't distasteful at the time. I think everybody thought it was quite cheeky and funny and, and that sort of stuff, you know. Uh, but I've thought about it and put it back, and now every time I think about it, I'm going to think, oh, that was so distasteful, because I've completely yeah. framed it now in the context of, you know, the meeting, well, no, I shouldn't say the meeting movement, it just, it seems completely yeah. logical and obvious yeah. that we're all we're completely sexist. equal, yeah. we shouldn't be sexist yeah. and all those sorts of things, but, completely, but... But because you've <laughs> now tagged on that feeling of disgust... Yes, yeah you always remember that feeling of disgust and not... Correct. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. It's kind of why I brought it up, because I yeah. thought, well, that's a good example, because yeah. you know, if anybody remembers it, when you think about it now, it is a bit uncomfortable. You know? So how does that relate into designing in flow and how, how that all relates to design and visuals? Yeah, I was thinking about that, thinking about uh, what... How, how, how I can present that. I was thinking well, that... Um, I was thinking if you, if you were to imagine a poster and it's just a white poster with nothing on it, it can be any shape, dimensions you want, and then you put a word on it, and maybe the word is hello, and you think, and you've all got different versions of that in your head now, it's, some of it's in a really tight, tight face on black on a white background, some is probably really colourful or, you know, f delicate or whatever, we've all got different interpretations of what that means. And imagine the text is not in the centre of the, of, of the poster, but it's at the top, and therefore there's a space beneath it, and you're thinking, what do I fill that space with? What is saying hello? And that's and what, the map, by the what, way. Yeah, yeah, whatever you put in it is, going to, is automatically, the individual creates their own third narrative. Yeah. So say, for example, it's a lemon. Hello, it's now a lemon. everyone's thinking of a lemon. Or thinking it's a heart-shaped pillow with some chocolates, hello. All of a sudden it's becoming slightly different conversation. And maybe it's a knife stuck in the pie poster and it says hello. There's already, we're creating, all of us, individual massive narratives out of literally just changing a picture or changing a word. Mm. You know, say if it was a knife and it said love above it, that's really chilling. Yeah. And it's just the two things working together which is the core of when you're thinking about creating or thinking about whatever you're doing, making, creating a design or whatever, is everything is relational. And that, and the, the moment you have an A and a B, you are creating a narrative for somebody to interpret. Yeah. And I want to add to that is uh, comic books <laughs> has an unwritten rule on how, to, how it is designed and flows because in an American comic you have a, you start from the left and you work your way to the right and then you start from the top and work your way to the bottom and that's how it kind of flows and design and it gets to uh, a point where you can just read it 
smoothly and without any instructions and that's kind of how your eyes follow the pictures as well and like a way a good way to describe the visuals of it is the person speaking first is always on the left and the person replying to that is always on the right and you kind of see these unwritten rules well if you look for them you'll see these unwritten rules but for anyone who doesn't know the rules it's just oh it's natural it flows perfectly yeah and that's American comics. In Japanese comics or any other uh, Arabic comics, it goes from right to left. And you don't have, and again, these uh, unwritten rules present themselves to the person who's reading it. And there's no instructions, you just, people just know it flows. That, that's, that's purely cultural, and that, and that is. Um language shapes your brain so when you're learning a language and you're you know two years old or one years old or whatever it the, the words the sounds of the words the shapes of the words the way you string sentences together and the meaning of words actually is creating pathways in the brain uh, when you're going to learn uh, uh, in England if we learn a, uh, a, a kind of another Latin based language it's quite easy yeah. because all of those things are already in place the right to the left the top to the bottom um, when you're thinking in Arabic or when you're thinking yeah. in Chinese, you know, you're, you're thinking that the way your actual brain is hardwired is different. Yeah. It is, is different. And there are, fantastically, words that exist, which I love, words that exist in other languages that have no direct translation to yes. the to, to, to UK. And what that means is, is that other cultures in our language are thinking differently. Yeah. They are thinking and feeling differently. Just the word déjà vu doesn't have a direct translation anywhere else. Seen before, isn't it? Huh? Does it mean seen before? Seen before, but then like people don't understand yeah, yeah. seen before. Yeah. Like, like it's a, it's not the same meaning. Uh, structures. So we talked about uh, the structure of a story, like the acts that the uh, child was told. There was a beginning, middle, and the end. Yeah. And that is the basis of uh, a lot of storytelling, which is... Well, it's storytelling, but, but not... And when we say storytelling, I think it's important to break out of this idea of um, a novel or a script or a film or an advert or something moving. There is a story to be told in a chair from your experience yes. of it from beginning to end, the colour the, 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 that you associate with every other chair you've ever seen. Yes. You know, you're already, already comparing it and, and those sorts of things. And that, again, relates to the map and territory. You have a different chair in your mind every time someone says chair or table. You have a different idea of what table is. And, uh, yeah, it's, and the story behind the table in your mind is going to be different in every different person. Yeah. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll just go a little bit off piste, and if, yeah. if you're okay for me to talk about no, map and territory a little bit, because yeah. it's something that I have spent a lot of time no, thinking fair. about. Um, the, the digital and the virtual worlds that now are everywhere, te even television, radio, books, or whatever, um, they create other worlds, and I don't believe our brains from all the kind of limited research that I've done, can distinguish between going to log on to Facebook and going for a walk with your dog. Your brain is creating a mental map. And the map is expanding massively mm. with 3D video games and all sorts of things that people are now experiencing, especially younger people. Um, and the problem with those territory, the, the, those maps, is that they can be altered and that what they what they can do is alter your reality and that's always been the case really if we even talk about talk about a religious text mm. you know that is a map yeah. and it's instructing you and changing the way the world works but it's now kind of insidious with video games and and facebook and and all those kind of things because yeah. they're not real territories they're all virtual territories and they can be manipulated yeah. you know everybody presents their best self yes you know 
My, my string of convictions obviously aren't on Facebook. You know, yeah. just, um. like, uh, yeah, <coughs> like if you think about Instagram influencers, yeah. they're always presenting their best self. But yeah. they're, telling, they're telling a story, but it's not the truth. And that's, I think it's important to know that, to determine like, just because uh, you're doing something that appeals to everyone doesn't mean that's where you are now. It's a, you're just on a journey. I actually think it's dehumanising. It's as if we're all involved in our own little individual publicity arms race and, and actually takes away from our humanity a little bit. We're all presenting this very glossy um, front and, and actually underneath we're flawed and beautiful and tragic and yeah. very complex, you know, as, as, as for all of us, you know, uh, and, uh, and this kind of virtual world which tends to occupy so many people um, so much of the time is a fiction. Yeah. So, there we go. Uh, going that wasn't necessarily no, structured. Sorry, yeah, apologies, so everyone. Also, uh, in the promo video we did, you talked about the structure of the loop. Oh, it's just, you asked me what, what was a, what is on it? the spot, yes. you've got 10 seconds, Mark, yeah. on the spot, what is a narrative structure that you really like? And it is a, it's kind of coercive and emancipatory kind of narrative. And I really like the pyramid uh, in, uh, at the entrance to the Louvre in, in Paris. Um, I'm not commenting on the art gallery or Paris or anything like that, but there is something about that structure that when you enter it, it just continues to surprise, but not shock, and it's informative, it, it's, um, and delightful. The light, yeah. the, the, the way it's just constructed. It, it takes you on a journey. Yes, and that's exactly what that. storytelling yeah. is. It's yeah. taking you on a journey of discovery. Yeah. And the more you look for it, the more you discover. Is that a good? Way of I think that's a fantastic way of putting it. Yeah, I, th I think I think it's wonderful, and I'm sure most of you have been. But uh, recall it now, and then put it back in your new Me Too world, and think <laughs> it's still wonderful. Yeah. <coughs> so, simple or complex stories? Which one would you prefer? Or oh, what do I prefer? Yeah. Um, uh, when I, when you're working on something, when you're working on a design, uh, and I'm you know being commissioned to work on a I'll work on a project. I always try and boil everything down, I, you know, unpack it and boil it down and boil it down and boil it down and boil it down until we've almost got nothing. We're just right at the core of what that is. And at that point is when you start building it up mm -hmm. and you start layering it and you make it more complex and you think about who you're appealing to and why you're appealing to them and what you want them to feel. Or That sounds quite insidious, doesn't it? Yeah, but it is true. Um, uh, yeah, so, so simple and complex, I think, is, is, is the right thing to say. Yeah. So I mean, I'll come back to kind of like hello and the lemon, you know. So, yeah. But I'll take it far back down to that, whatever it is. Well, I think a lot of great stories come from a really simple idea. Yeah. And what they call the elevator yeah. pitch, if anybody's familiar oh. with that, you know, the kind of... Anyone know what the elevator pitch is? The elevator pitch, So yeah. basically you have to try and tell your story in the time you're in the elevator. With that sell pot yourself. shop producer. Yeah. Sell yourself. Pardon? Sell yourself. That, sell yourself yeah. very quickly, sell like yourself, that. Yeah. And sometimes you have to do it in one sentence. Yeah. And it's the most stressful and... Well, it's kind of unnecessary, but the thing is time is at a premium and, and you know, there's, you know, in the creative industries, um, a lot of people perceive it as or they want to break into it, or it's yeah. glamorous, or whatever it may be. And everybody seems to be under pressure. But then on the flip side of it, if you try to say one simple thing, but written in like 10 pages, it kind of dilutes the point because you, you've lost the interest. Yes, yeah. Yeah, but so, well, I mean, you know, simple or complex depends on the context. Mm. You know, if I'm being asked to make a 10 second promo for a show, I'm thinking, okay, well, I've seen this show, I was at the filming, I've met everybody, this is how it's working, this is what it's about. What, what, number one, what's the purpose of the promo? Am I making it to sell the show 
abroad or am I making it to go on TV to get people to watch it? Um, and so what you will do is you're taking you know, an hour long piece of film and you're boiling it right down to 10 seconds yeah. um, and crying as you go, no, that's a brilliant scene. No, it's got to go, you know, it won't, <laughs> won't fit. Kill your darlings. Yeah. 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 And yeah, it's <coughs> stripping, yeah, stripping something complex into something simple is always a very stressful thing to do, I find. I, it's what I, in fact, I'd say that's the core of what I do, yeah. is actually looking at you know, a quite complex themes and kind of trying to distill them down into an identity that is going to become familiar or a piece of music that's going to become familiar or something like that. Like, yeah, if you're making uh, a poster, for example, you're trying to sell what you're doing into a poster and make it captivating for people who see it. See it and, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you're trying to hook them in. Yeah, exactly. It's all about the hook. <laughs> Make the audience think. Um, the best stories are the ones where the individual puts something of themselves in. I'm not a fan of going to the cinema and having little bits of water thrown in my face and, and the seat moving and all those kind of things because what it's doing is it's kind of taking away from my imagination. And they say the pictures are better on the radio. Yeah. And I would actually say books are always better than films. Because what's happening is that you're using your imagination, you're using your own memory. You know, I go and see a film at the cinema and I'm being thrown around in a, in a seat yeah. and whatever. It's completely forgettable. Completely forgettable. But I've read a book and I'll never forget it. I never forget it because I created those pictures. And, you and you're inside the story as well. You're, yeah. like, you're in the world watching it all unfold. Yeah. You're People can't see you, but yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, and yeah, one of the uh, things I love about stories is that it makes people like you can evoke a lot of emotions just purely by what you're trying to tell. Like you can make them scared, you can make them cry, you can make them happy. It's. Are you fam anybody familiar with the phrase in Dexical Trace? You know what that means. It's, um, um, it is a device that you might use in any art form that provokes uh, a reaction in your audience, but is only a whisper of what they think it is. Let me give you, I'm trying to think of a good example. Okay, so we're in a horror film. Hmm? Indexical Trace. Indexical Trace. Imagine we're watching a horror film and it's the start of a horror film and it's in a house and it's late at night and it's dark and there's a patter of rain outside and the occasional crack of thunder and those sorts of things and a woman is alone and she walks through her dark house and she opens the fridge and she's bathed in the light of the fridge and somewhere you hear a creak on a floorboard. Your mind has just gone boom that's an indexical trace. That's a little device, a little thing where you have invited the audience to suddenly imagine. And that act makes you engage with what you're yeah. doing, with what you're watching, with what you're, you know, further. You've, you've set something up, you've created anticipation. That's uh, yeah. Another good example of that is when there's a, you're in a fun fair and you're walking down uh, a dark, uh, haunted house okay, yeah. and suddenly everything goes quiet and you can't hear a thing and you're that's when you're always expecting something to jump out or something exactly right that, I mean, that happens in uh, in when you're writing a score because uh, yeah. I've just obviously I've scored yes. a horror film yes exactly. um, which had comedy moments in which was quite difficult to kind of take the audience <laughs> on that journey um, but it precisely that there were moments within the film where we went how we've got this lovely theme, it's moody, it's dark, it's all minor key, all this sort of stuff, and it's, you know, tension and rhythm, be building up and building up and building up. And then we just got to a point where we went, kill the music at that point, kill it. <laughs> and nothing else needed to happen. But all of a sudden the audience goes, oh, paying attention. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's the, the antithesis of a score, you know. It's yes. A, 
the, the, the gaps, the silences, are where the audience's imagination grows. Yeah. That happens in design. Take you back to the poster. Hello, knife, lemon, whatever, box of chocolates. There's a relationship between the two. You've not been explicit about it. You've not said, come and enjoy these lovely chocolates at blah, 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 or anything. All of a sudden, your imagination just grows within it. And I think probably that's, this is the, the most important aspect or part of any story. Yeah is trying to invite the audience in and to engage and construct some part of the narrative of themselves for, the, for themselves. It will make it memorable. Yeah. And what it makes it even more memorable is if you surprise them and misdirect them and make them throw them something that they couldn't think of. Yeah, because you got like the M Night Shyamalan film yeah, or something yeah. like that, where, where you know it's been in plain sight the whole time. Yeah but all of a sudden it's kind of presented from the back and you go, oh yeah. my goodness, you know, yeah, that yeah. works and as a device, always, yeah. yeah. And another, in design, uh, if you see like a magazine for, in the newsagent, you see a magazine full of uh, bright coloured pictures and photos and so, and then you see a blank, uh, blank cover of one particular magazine with its title and nothing else, it's just white. You've noticed that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, that, I mean, that, that's doing the same trick. Yes. Is, is it what you're doing? You're being invited to speculate um, and, you know, invited to speculate that the contents are not for general publication or they are explicit yeah. or they are intelligent and intriguing yeah. and every product and everything we buy is related to how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about that product so you might be cool enough to buy a magazine with nothing on the cover yeah. or not yeah. you or know not. already we've but entered into another narrative of yeah. you know how we relate to product and object yeah. and the psychology of storytelling. I've just said it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned the emancipatory... Oh, emancipa oh, okay. So, yeah, in terms of narrative, m m unfortunately, most of um, the manufactured world is presented to us in a way which is coercive. It's getting you to drink it, eat it, put, you, put it on your hair, wear it, or whatever, drive it, da, da, da. it's all coercive. But really the best uh, narratives are the ones, again, which are emancipatory. They release you, they inform you. They're not trying to hammer you into parting with your money or, or you know, or something like that. You know, they, they are of, their, of themselves, they are joyous, they are, you know, they are art or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and they're vitally important, equally important, whatever, you know, just unfortunately the commercial world, yeah. you know, drip, drip, drip. Yeah, that's one of the things about social media, it kind of uh, it has a lot of, it's designed to make you want to click that notification to see what's going to, uh, to see what's behind that little red dot. You've got something there that you want to just I want to know what, who's liked my thing. Yes, that's right, yeah, yeah. And it's all, as I say, this kind of, we're all, all celebrities and we're all in this kind of arms race of self-promotion. Yeah. Whereas, you know, we probably need a bit more mindfulness and reflection. Yeah. And, and, sort of and what was the other uh, story telling you? Well, no, we, I, I said you've got the kind of um, coercive, oh, coercive, coercive yeah. but then you've got, Emancipate. you know, em emancipatory narratives, yeah. which you know, can just be the beauty of architecture yeah. or, the, or the way a garden is arranged or a piece of sculpture or even, you know, graphic design or, yeah, or the art that we or have whatever. outside. Yeah. 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 It's something you can just walk around and discover. It's not something that's in your face and it's not pushing you out to uh, discover it. It's just, it's just there and you can just walk around at your own pace, at your... Uh, well, the designs which kind of contribute to your, your sense of self-worth uh, being and all those kind of things. Whereas I actually think coercive design tends to kind of undermine people. It undermines your decision making. And it's very forgettable as well. Yeah. 
like once you've hit that like uh, notification button to see what who's liked it, you don't care about it anymore. Whereas if it's a massive page for uh, storytelling, you could, you discover it and you'll probably remember it in ten years time. Or maybe, yeah, or certainly absorb it into yeah. your kind of narrative yeah, of, of you, you yeah. relate yourself to that story. Yeah. Whereas when it's coercive and you, it's in your face, you'll see it and maybe you'll remember it for a little while, but then it's very forgettable. Yeah. What happens with, and it's kind of almost narcissistic behaviour, is with a lot of, let's take an, an emancipatory idea, like a painting that you love. Uh, a lot of people will purchase even product like that in order to define who they are to other people mm -hmm. rather than actually the simple joy of experiencing what you've bought yourself yeah because you know we're all frightened of being judged we're all frightened of you know we all want the approval of our peers yes and it's yeah it's not because uh yeah it's more about trying to impress someone yeah but you're not doing it because you like it you're just doing it so that someone likes it so they like you yes yeah dangerous don't go there yeah yeah don't don't let other people influence your own light. But we've all done it, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's... I think, I think a lot of what I hopefully have talked about is kind of dipped into psychology a little bit. Yeah. So I hope we've kind of covered that subject. So. No, I find it really interesting. I hope it's uh, interesting for everyone here as well. Uh, does anyone have any questions? <gasps> Please. I wanted to ask you about the, with the rhythm that's peace as well, is it? The sort of well, in, in, what, in what context? In sort of like a painting, for example, or, or kind of... I suppose with anything, you're talking about storytelling or yeah. painting, or just, but a kind of, as um, part of the, 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 the holding the, the audience, is, is that also uh, part of... That's part, part of, of the, the flow. Piece? Yeah, the flow. flow is so yeah. fast and... So it needs to flow, but also have a different... Energy, yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You can do that in all sorts of ways. I mean, just you can do it with just volume. You can do it with rhythm. I mean, this is especially important when it comes to when I was scoring uh, to picture. Um, you're considering how that pace works all the time. Uh, that I, I think it almost comes back to this idea of little moments that I was talking about earlier about um, you know how we don't think of nows as very tiny sharp points we actually think of them as this kind of cloud of an idea and once you've latched onto that and you start listening to a piece of music or you're watching a narrative between characters bounce back and forward and you're thinking about how do you pace that how do you speed it up do you edit it so that with fast cuts between left and right so that you can take quite a passive boring scene and all of a sudden you can accelerate how you feel about it because you're doing lots of little cuts between that person spoke, that person spoke, that person spoke, that person spoke. Or do you just present the whole thing? That person spoke, that person spoke. In your mind, it will feel like a different flow, a different pace. And then you can add music to it and those kind of things and you can get the audience really... Yeah. Is anyone familiar with Aaron Did that Sorkin? help? Is that, yes, that okay, fine. Yes, Is anyone familiar uh, with the works of Aaron Sorkin? He wrote The West Wing, uh, The Social Network. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the way he scripts a film is that he has a lot of uh, in interruptions between conversations, like they're arguing and it's never I talk, you talk, I talk, you talk. It's I talk and then you interrupt and then the other person interrupts back. And it's quite fast flowing and natural, but it's also deceptive because not everyone talks that way. Like some people are patient and they will listen, but the way he writes it, it's always, fast-paced and uh, informative and sometimes robotic but it's also full of passion and uh, energy as well it's always dynamic and that kind of flow doesn't happen without being designed that way that's right the the interesting thing, most films are not accurate depictions of how we actually behave. Yeah. If you just film a room of people talking, that's not how films work at all. <laughs> films are written in a way to 
make us feel like we want to be there or part of it or, or something like that. It's not actually real. You know, there are few ums and ahs in, uh, in film, in act, you know, when you're seeing, I'm going to um and ah now, I can't stop myself now, I said it. <laughs> um, there you go. <coughs> Creating and making and telling a story, we don't tend to put that. The ums and the ahs are not in the novel. Mm. They are not in the film. That's true. Uh, any other questions, please? Do you think that we've lost kind of um, the art of storytelling or have we progressed over the years? I, I, neither, neither. I, I think the, it seems to me that the art of storytelling is, is innate in us. You know, from uh, f children know how to tell stories. In fact, the moment that they think of language and they think about the relationship between I'm picking an object up there are three things there that they have to connect and that is a story that is a narrative we don't even realize how we are thinking about the world i think we think about it in terms of stories we don't think about it in little moments we're we're constantly doing it you only have to go back to i don't know what's the oldest is it gilgamesh you uh, from the kind of euphrates civilization 5000 years ago this epic the hero of uh, the epic of Gilgamesh, of the, uh, the, the story structure, the narrative arc and all the rest of it is the same as Godzilla or something. It's not, you know, so I don't necessarily think we have moved on. Um, but what we have done is we are constantly reinventing ourselves. We're constantly taking the same themes, tropes and those sorts of things and refashioning them, reworking them in the context of how our culture is moving and shifting and changing the whole time. Oh, I think, uh, I think, yeah, I think when it comes to um, the way that the world is now so virtual, um, I think uh, there's a danger. I, th I, th I think there's a natural... What did you do, Ed? <laughs> is that right? Time's up, yeah. stop. Um, I think there's a natural... I've lost my thread now, I'm so sorry. Um, so we were talking, yes, so in the, in the virtual world that we inhabit so readily now, I think we are, are the competition for our inten uh, attention is so intense uh, that yes, we have lost something. You know, and I'm not saying, oh, we should all just go and read a damn good novel now because no. I like great films and I like going to see films where I can turn my brain off, you know, and just be entertained and I don't want to think about it. And there's too many of those, but, you know, um, uh, they put bums on seats at the cinema. Yeah. Um, it, but, very, yeah, we've lost something. Yeah. Yeah. It's very all about commercial and it's less about the story I feel like there's a lot of films out there it's just for the spectacle and it's never really about the substance that's true uh, however there's a part of me that really defends that wants to defend all of that and it's a kind of from an ecological perspective I think we should be entertaining each other more and making less I actually think on top of that you know, I'd love all of us to work in film or be able to write novels and paint and, and that sort of yeah. stuff because, you know, we, without giving a lesson, a sermon here, we have to make less stuff. And so what are you going to do with your time? We have to become storytellers again yeah. and not consumers. Yes. I think that's a perfect place to stop it. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, for everyone. Attending. Thank you. Thank you.